All right, Mr. Casey Ellison, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you for doing this, sir. Um, you, your, you and your firm has been a part of incredible projects around Tampa. Uh, Sparkman Wharf, Stovall, Oxford Exchange, Armature Works, just to name a few. When people come to Tampa and they go to the, all of these amazing places, usually they visit a place that you built. That's amazing. We are very fortunate uh, to have been involved in some really great projects in the, in, in a great city. In a um, fantastic city. And so, you know, I can't tell you how thankful we are for the, the opportunity that those owners have given us to be involved in those projects. How did you get started in construction? I know your father was a contractor. Could you give me your origin story? So my father was uh, a contractor, or is a contractor still. Um, we moved from Atlanta to Tampa in 1985. He moved here to open the offices for another contracting firm, uh, Beck. Um, and funny story is he had the choice of Miami, Orlando, or Tampa. And chose Tampa, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and so in 85, we moved here. And then uh, through, through all my schooling, I worked construction jobs. I worked as everywhere from, you know, a, a dig, digging ditches as a laborer to cleaning up, uh, being in charge of cleaning up everybody's lunch debris to... <laughs> field engineering to superintendent, uh, project manager, and eventually development manager. Wow. Uh, while going to USF, graduated USF with a degree in finance, wanted to go into real estate development. Um, and so at the time, Beck had an opportunity in their development management group. So I took that. Uh, we... As development managers, that's when we did Victory Lofts in Channel Side. We did uh, Station Square in downtown Clearwater um, and a few other projects. Uh, 07, decided I wanted to do something for myself. Sat down with my dad, told him what I was thinking. He said, I would hate for you to be sitting where I'm sitting 20 years from today and regret that you didn't take the shot. So I left uh, and started, uh, at the time, Ellison Development to do, at the time we were going to do small retail development and uh, um, mini storage facilities, mm -hmm. public, and uh, oh, first six months out, did two retail deals, did not have a good experience with that small to medium contractor and felt like there there was a gap in the market for a very professional institutional acting contractor in that smaller market. So mm. we started a construction company. The thought is we would make margin on the development, make margin on the construction. Oh, eight happened, uh, lost. Um, the development business went down to basically nothing. We had two or three storage facilities going. Uh, Lehman brothers was one of our partners uh, got a call on a Friday, said, don't show up on Monday. There's no we, good luck getting paid. And uh, Damn. so we, the construction company grew year over year through that period of time. And we uh, really concentrated on the construction business until about three or four years ago and really started pushing back into the development space. I was in high school during the recession, so <clears throat> I, I can only talk to people that were in business during it, but it happened that quick. Like literally during the week, you're going through the motions of this construction project and Friday they call and cut the whole thing off. That quick. Wow. And your thought at the time, first of all, let's go back to Tampa, right? Because you said your father kind of had a choice. He wanted to move to Florida and I guess Beck gave him the choice mm -hmm. to go to a different city. Why Tampa? He felt at the time like Tampa was the mo was the friendliest of the cities. Uh, he felt like it was the most inclusive. From a, he had an opportunity to come here and and make it and meet the right people and create relationships that would then help the business flourish. He didn't feel the same vibe in Orlando or Miami. Mm. Tampa's always had that diverse 
culture too. I mean, our origin story is basically a bunch of immigrants coming to one place for opportunity. It's like the story of America, really. We, we've been diverse from the get-go. That's awesome. Your dad recognized that and said, that's where I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he liked, he also loves the water and mm. all that. And this is a very, so Orlando's out. <laughs> yeah. This is a very water, uh, inclusive community we a lot of fishing a lot of interaction with the bay and some of the best fishing in the world is in tampa bay yeah so recession happens you kind of shift gears have to consolidate and and figure out the direction you want to go from there the development portion essentially stops yeah except for those couple projects yeah and then is that when you focus on the actual construction being a gc yeah, we were pretty focused at that point on growing the construction business. So what was maybe the first projects you were doing in the 2000s? So we're probably getting into what, 2010, 11, 12, that kind of era. Mm-hmm. So um, we were doing, at the time, we were doing some homes, mm. which is where when you look at the construction company today, I think you would argue our niche is quality. Um, what across different project sectors, and I think that really comes from our start was in high end homes in South Tampa, and we created a stable of incredible craftsmen, and those craftsmen have grown with us throughout the years into the commercial business. So that's where we we started with with some homes, large homes, and we were doing small retail. Um, and small commercial type stuff, and uh, and then our first real break was Oxford Exchange. Wow! And Oxford Exchange was seventeen. I'm trying to think the year that started construction. So maybe earlier. Oxford Exchange um, was it opened eleven years ago, twelve years in September. Okay. My second daughter, Charlie, was born the day Oxford Exchange opened. Wow! So I always know exactly. What day Oxford Exchange opened? Yeah, don't ever forget that date. <laughs> <laughs> so so you said your craftsmen you've taken from home building all the way up to the stove all, for example. So quite literally, like the guy that was building the cabinets is building those beautiful beams in the ceiling of the stove all. So a lot of our uh, subcontractors and partners have kind of follow, come along Wow. The, the ride with us. Yeah. What do you attribute that to? Is it is it the way you treat your people? Is it the pay? I mean, it, it sounds interesting that those people would stick around for so long. You know, we try to appreciate and protect those guy, those folks that are doing great work. Yeah, they're important. Yeah, and uh, they're kind of the lifeblood of the whole thing, right? Totally, and so, kind of a lost art, right? Like finding those really good craftsman style contractors. They're few and far between. They are few and far between. Although I tell you, Tampa's again, Tampa St. Pete is there's a there's a nice crop of artisans happening in in this market now. How involved? I guess we'll we'll start at Oxford Exchange. How involved was your firm in the design of Oxford Exchange? So we were there and we were a partner in it. We um, definitely spent a lot of time uh, with the architecture group and the interiors group. Uh, but that design was really led by Blake Casper and uh, James Brearley, who was working with Blake at the time. Absolute unbelievable finishes in this place. I was there for coffee last week, and every time I go, I look up in that main room and think, gosh, this is incredible. And I think people who visit Tampa when they go to Oxford Exchange get that feeling too. You really feel like you're in a different place. You do, for sure. Wow. Unbelievable. So this was your break project, first big project into commercial construction. Yes. And then after Oxford Exchange at the completion, were you getting calls left and right? I mean, did your business explode? They probably all want to work with the the construction company that builds an incredible place like that. It definitely, it has definitely helped over the years for sure. Um, I think it kind of set the standard and uh, we've been fortunate to continue on with that. It's amazing. It's incredible. 
And so what were the challenges? Because that was an old stable, I believe, right? That's a very old building. Is there anything unexpected? I mean, what did the shell look like when you started to peel back the hood? So, yes, originally it was a horse stable for the Tampa Bay Hotel across the street uh, or the Plant Hotel. See if you can find a picture of that, Tyler. And um, it had most recently when we started the demo been a photography studio. Um, and then the building, which we actually tore down, which is where the dining room, the main dining room in had been um, various office uses over the years. But uh, when we started to tear back or peel back the onion, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, at one point, you could tell that it was a retail arcade and uh, there was, there was like 27 different slab elevations through the, on the two sides. So you can see that how there was an arcade down the center. Right. And apparently what they did was if you came in and you wanted 400 square feet, they put walls in and poured a floor and that was your, that was your store. And so when we tore everything out, we ended, we had to tear all the slab on grade out because there was just too many elevation changes to mm. even start to try to figure it out. So those those construction challenges, and then you also mentioned too, you're you're kind of learning about history as you go. Like you you uncover something, you're like, oh, this was used for whatever. Yeah, yeah. We found all kinds of uh, artifacts uh, in the ground there, from horseshoes to wow, old. Uh, Soda bottles to medicine bottles to, I mean, just a ton of different stuff over wow. the process, which they still have, and they're, it's kind of strewn around in the Commerce Club. That's crazy. How old is that building? It's got to yeah, be early 1900s. Early maybe? 1900s. Scroll down, Tyler, see if there's any other pictures there. There was two circles in the upper section that we found out. Those were hay bales, and they used to throw hay down through the oh, bale, through the, through the circles into the stables below. That's awesome. And there's talk that Teddy Roosevelt uh, stored horses there with, uh, uh, as the Rough Riders uh, were in and out of Cuba over That's the years. wild. We'll jump ahead a little bit and talk about this kind of attention to quality and detail that people clearly enjoy, right? There, there's no more conceptual you know, proof we would need to, to know that people in Tampa enjoy nice things. I mean, you go to Oxford Exchange, it's packed. People love it. How many Oxford Exchanges, so to speak, could you build to where they start to become empty? Like my, my, my question is, do you think that Tampa could enjoy more of places like this? I think absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think they have, I mean, look at Stovall house, uh, even in the restaurant space, you know, Union and right. Poulon. And you look at, since Oxford Exchange, I would argue, the finish, fit and finish interior design game has been raised mm -hmm. in, in this market. Certainly. And, and I think those, the spaces that that pay attention to that are rewarded for it in the marketplace. Absolutely. And, and it's clear because, you know, you go to any one of these, I would say Tampa landmark destinations, and again, they're packed, but they're not just packed with people that are visiting, right? Tourists. It's like people that have lived here their whole lives. Like me, like I'm, I'm from here. My family's from here. I go to a place like the Stovall or Oxford. I'm inspired. I'm like, wow, Tampa needs more of this stuff. It's amazing. Um, after Oxford exchange, what was the next large project and how quick did it happen? The next large project was the f probably uh, the fitness center at University of Tampa, mm. um, and that was three or four years after Oxford from a uh, timing perspective. Is that because they look across the street and go, wow, look at that incredible place. Let's call that builder. I think it helped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure, right? So, so that huge, I think it's a large building. Am I correct? Am I thinking of the right spot? It's a large fitness center, multi-level. Yeah, is. this place. Yeah, it is. And then the heart of UT is there in the center, which was a really, really fun process to design uh, and custom fabricate the, the heart. You can see it kind of in the center of the building there. There's the, the red 
uh, two-story uh, sculpture up the middle of the building. I've got a couple former students, alumni that work at my real estate company, and they always talk about it. They love that spot. Everyone's super excited about it, especially the pool. Yeah. Kids yeah. love that pool. Yeah, pool's impressive. Coming from up, you know, the northeast, you come to Florida, you get to hang out in the sun, 365. It's a sweet spot. So this was the first ground up large scale commercial building project that you guys did because Oxford was, you know, essentially a historic renovation in a sense. It was, it's, it's an adaptive reuse, you know, but yes, ground up. I mean, Oxford in its own way was ground up. I mean, we, you know, we shored the four walls of the main building and built a structure inside, tore the, the old IBM building down next door and then rebuilt what is now the dining room and commerce club. But yeah, ground up. This would probably this was our first major project. It's beautiful, very well done brick. It's it's pretty. I mean, love it and it fits in with UT great. Did you guys again have any sort of the design, or you were just the GC on this project? So we again were again very involved through the design process. Eric Career was the architect. Dr. Vaughn is super involved in all design decisions on the campus. Um, so as we were part of the team, we were there to give our opinion when that was wanted to be heard. And we mm. were there to make sure that it was constructible at the end of the day. And, and we could give them the look that they wanted. Fantastic. And then moving down to the stove all house, that was a, uh, I guess a challenging project to get through. It's obviously an old estate style home and it's turned into a private club, which I know some people were questioning of course, but now that it's built, people love it and enjoy it. I was there last week. I mean, it's uh, every time I go on the Stovall property, I don't feel like I'm in Tampa. I feel like I'm on vacation. The way that they've designed that space is really incredible. Yeah, it is. And it, it's very effective. I mean, uh, sitting on the patio at Stovall on a March afternoon in the afternoon is one of the best spots you could ever find yourself. See if you can find a picture of the courtyard Tyler I don't know if they have a gallery probably not um but the grounds are incredible um moving that birdcage greenhouse to the front let's talk about that because wasn't that in the back of the property originally so it was it was in the back of the property um so that that greenhouse was built and designed by a family in just outside of London they do all the greenhouses for the royal family. And I had one of our folks really, really dive into who it was. And we got a hold of them, and they agreed they could come to Tampa, take it apart. We could store it off site and then put it back later. But uh, Blake uh, really wanted to move it. And so we moved it. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was a fascinating process for sure. Uh, we happened to decide we were going to move it just before we got uh, like two and a half feet of rain over three weeks. So lots of sleepless nights of having the thing propped up and worrying about it sinking back into the ground before we could get it moving. And definitely an interesting process. I, I the The moving company was a group – third generation house movers out of Southern Louisiana. And they spoke some dialect of Southern Louisiana. That's not exactly the English language in this purest form. <laughs> and, uh, and they were, they were fascinating. They were, they were doing all this, th this stuff. And I walked up to him and I said, where's the uh, approved shop drawings that show kind of how these structural beams work. And he looked at me and he goes, they're in my head. And I was like, oh, okay. And uh, he goes, I'm third generation. I know what I'm doing. I was like, oh, okay. And I said, so have you ever moved a house that's all glass? He goes, well, I haven't done that before. And I was like, so maybe we should talk about beam sizing. And he, I've been doing this. I'm third generation. Leave me alone. I was like, okay. And so that was pretty much the last time I had any substantial conversation with the guys moving the greenhouse. Wow. What made you choose that guy? I mean, is it just his confidence that won you over? I mean, they were the only ones that wanted to take on moving an all glass uh, greenhouse. How does that, I mean, so is there insurance? Like if they broke it, they pay for it. How does that work? Uh, no, no, no. Everybody that looked at it, we had to sign 
unconditional waivers that if it broke, it was broke. Yeah. So. And you got these Louisiana boys to come move that thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Now, how do you find that's such a special contractor, right? Obviously. I mean, did you start in Tampa to find a company that would do it? So they had worked uh, for a customer of ours in Clearwater years before. Ah, so you're familiar with them. Yeah. That is hilarious. And he's like, hey, I got it, man. Don't worry. And you're yeah. like, all right. Yeah. And they did it. They did it. So what, what did they put it on almost like a, a tank track type deal or a semi trailer? How'd they literally move it? So they, uh, they drive steel beams underneath it and then they, they go in and they prop, uh, like these kind of tracks underneath it. And then they pull it up onto a, like a low boy trailer wow. and they move it and then they slide it back onto the new foundations wherever they're moving it. In this case, we are moving it to the front. And the whole time your fingers are crossed like, well. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and they cracked no glass. Hey, they killed it, right? They did a great job. And it's in such a beautiful, better place, I would say. Because I think where it is, you wouldn't have been able to do kind of the L-shaped where the orangery restaurant is. And I mean, the whole project worked because you could move this, essentially. No, it was in the back. It was where the parking is. Oh, but they okay. wanted it to be pronounced and in the front and the clock tower be kind of in the up along Bay Shore. Right. And have the ability for the members to enjoy it and it be up closer to the water, more mm -hmm. visible. That makes sense. Yeah, go to that courtyard picture, Tyler. On the top above that. Yeah, look at that. It doesn't look like Tampa, at least the Tampa I grew up in in the 90s. No, definitely not. They do incredible work. So that's, I guess, Oxford Design Studio, right? And and Blake, Allison, the whole Casper family are the yeah. ones that are driving the design. Yeah, Blake and uh, Tate and Jordan Winston, who's also with uh, Oxford Design. And then they used a, uh, they, they had a partner in Navarro Williams, who's a landscape architect out of Palm Beach. Pure talent. Super impressive. Super impressive. It's incredible. Now, how long was this project? Because you're dealing, you're kind of dealing with two things, right? You have the old historic house, which I, that house is over a hundred years old. Yeah. Look at that picture. Look at that. There you go. Unbelievable. So you actually went under the slab there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Man, that was a miracle. So the, so the stove all right, you're dealing with this historic home that you've completely renovated and then you also are dealing with new construction around the back side what were the challenges there any artifacts you found on that property it's a massive property right acres on right on bayshore it is it is um we did find a lot of good stuff on that site too although i think the former owner harry teasley was uh i think he found the majority of it before we got there he did a complete renovation of that property mm. when he bought it uh in the i guess the late 90s so there wasn't so it wasn't like oxford in that you're having to completely tear it apart so the the house itself was lightly touched and we had to put air uh fire suppression and um add a few walls we ripped there was a there was a patio that they had added that then turned into like a some kind of tv room we pulled it all back to the original structure but we, it, the, the house itself was pretty lightly touched. Mm. So mostly cosmetic, yeah. all those finishes. Yeah. The wood floor, I believe, is original. It is original, yes. It's really the perfect, that house is the perfect mix of new and old. Look at that picture, Tyler, too, the one with the lake in the front. That's interesting. Yeah, there was a, there was a pond. Now, that was there when Blake bought that property. It was. We filled that pond in. Wow. Now, do you have to divert water, or how does that all work? We pumped it and, Pump. and uh, cleaned it and pumped it into the storm system. The interesting thing about that pond is it, it had one of the largest collections of uh, Japanese koi in uh, the state of Florida. So we... Uh, we found a, a buyer and we, he came in and very carefully removed the koi from the pond before we could fill it in. You didn't call the Louisiana boys for that one? No, they would have removed them in a much different way. Yeah. <laughs> it would have involved treble hook. <laughs> yeah. A few nets and some, there probably would have been a, a fish fry on the property that afternoon. Oh Lord. 
So let's talk Sparkman Wharf. Phenomenal property. Another kind of an old Tampa landmark that was completely torn apart and renovated. I remember I saw the movie Signs there in like 2002. And the way that development was built, I think it was actually called Channel Side was the name of the development. You couldn't see the water. You would walk in from a side angle, kind of where you walk in now across from the parking lot. And there was a place called Stump Supper Club and a couple other retail spots. And you literally couldn't see the water. It was like the most ridiculous thing ever. Tyler, if you can pull up an old, maybe type like Channel Side 2005 or something like that. The way it's built now completely opened up to the the harbor, the turning basin, where you can actually see the water. You've got the cruise ships. You've got the lawn genius how how did you guys get contracted and then digging into that development and design so interesting story about channel side is i was uh i was a young project engineer on the original building mm. then i was seven or eight years later i was a i was the project manager on the tunnel project which is when we put that center entrance through the middle of channel side because of what you're talking about you used to have to walk all the way around the development to yeah. even get inside. And then the Chamber of Commerce, because nobody was leasing space there, moved in there. And I was the project manager on the Chamber of Commerce to uh, build out. And then Ellison Construction tore down half of that building and built Sparkman Wharf. So seen kind of all phases of this one. Uh, you know, James Nozar at the time was had a vision to do this. I think ultimately the goal is that it could be uh, when they get ready to do something more dense here, it can be that those containers can be picked up and moved and put somewhere else. Um, and so, but in the meantime, it's become a real gathering place and kind of, kind of a hub for that area of town. Yeah. See if you can find an old photo, Tyler, I guess you could try type in channel side. Two th- early 2000s maybe because because uh, people that have moved here since covid right they they don't know that it used to be different they, they just come and enjoy it and think wow what a great place interesting that the shipping containers was thought in a sense to be temporary yeah Got yeah some... the original channel site had bennigan's and right stump supper club and right a movie theater but not much else, really. No. It was, it was. But it was also like, you know, late 2000s recession. I mean, the economy had something to do with that, too. The way it's so lively now. You go there for a lightning game yeah, and it's it is. packed. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. I mean, to me, that's just classic Florida development. Name a city, early 2000s. That's what you got. Yeah, the classic EFIS, uh outdoor shopping yeah. experience. I think I would bet that there's not many of these left that I don't think that, that ultimately there was very few of these that were successful around the country. My dad told me that I think Jeb Bush vetoed it, but they were supposed to put the hard rock in that location. I've never heard that before. Yeah. I think early on when they were planning on where the Seminoles could, could place that casino, it was supposed to be on the waterfront here. Can you imagine how really fantastic that would be? That would be interesting. But yeah, now now they've got out east of town. Yeah. Scroll down, Tyler, see if you can see the water view or lack thereof. Cause it's, it's kind of funny, you know, I feel like Tampa really for a long time neglected the waterfront for sure. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. I mean, when I moved here in 85, uh, Hyde Park was a rough neighborhood Mm -hmm. in sections. And uh, Bayshore was nice, but there was a lot of houses on Bayshore that were not in the greatest condition just because people just didn't, for whatever reason, didn't, didn't didn't value the water. And then if you look at downtown, for years we turned our back in downtown to the Mm -hmm. river. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was the river walk that really kind of has changed that. Yeah, Mayor Iorio really pressed for that river walk, and Buckhorn kind of saw that through. And now 
it is one of the most popular destinations in the city. That's a perfect picture, Tyler. Sorry, I should have been more clear. That was before your time, right? Basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at that. So that that building on the south side isn't there anymore. Correct. And, you know, now they have events on that boardwalk and they do yoga. And I think F45 has classes. They've opened it up to the water. I, I love that because although we are in kind of a brackish environment we have a river it's not maybe the water people think of when they think of florida it's still water and it's still beautiful on a day like today 65 degrees gorgeous outside you want to be looking at the water you know you want to be enjoying it yeah and i think people at one point thought the port was an, an was ugly right mm -hmm. and there's actually i mean the port's actually very interesting to watch in motion so to watch the ships move and all the stuff move around the port's actually not a bad view not at all. And, and I think I think people recognize that now. I think at one point people thought, oh, it's ugly. You shouldn't really engage. So your construction company essentially rebuilt this channel side development. So you've taken out this south building. Um, the movie theater is now, is that still industrious it's office industrious. space? What was that conversion like? I mean, did you find anything interesting in that old movie theater? Besides old popcorn kernels, yeah, just a very unclean environment. Yeah, it was that that movie theater turned into a rave club at some point. I mean, it had quite a history. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I moved out of Tampa when I was eleven and moved back. How old was I? Twenty five. So I kind of missed that era, but I didn't know there was a rave club. That's hilarious. I guess yeah. they were just signing any Anything. tenant, they, <laughs> anyone who'd pay rent. Right? Yeah. And really now where that's positioned is fantastic. Like to have that retail on the front where the trolley line is, those places are very popular too. F45, I think you have a Coldwell Banker office, that new shortwave coffee company is always mm -hmm. packed. Noble Rice is there. Noble Rice. Like it's, it's, it's actually turned into a really strategic retail position in downtown. Whereas, I mean, it's basically the first 20 years it was dead. Yeah. It was. Now, how did that ownership transfer occur? Did Jeff Venick purchase that when he purchased the Lightning, or does the city own that dirt? No, he purchased this out of uh, some form of note purchase through the, I think it was actually the Bank of Ireland, or it was an Irish bank, uh, Anglo Bank, mm. I think it was what it was called. But it was a long, protracted process for him to get this at this site probably a post-recession type deal it was yeah. yeah i wish they'd add more retail too to that parking garage on the north side there to me that'd be perfect to have a retail corridor maybe that's in the works who knows we do need more retail downtown we do certainly that's the one thing i keep hearing people say you know we we had some awesome hotel projects. We've got some great condominiums, ton of residential, but really the one thing missing is the shopping retail. You know, Hyde Park Village has gotten, like you said, it's transformed over the last few decades. And you've got some really high end shops and more to come. But downtown Tampa needs some retail. We did the first phase of the Hyde Park renovations as well, where, oh. uh, um, geez, what's the name? Uh, On Swan, that building, we did that. Uh, reface and reconstruction of that, so that was a great start to uh, uh, and it's and been incredibly. That's another actually I think pretty pivotal project for Tampa because again, out of town developer came in, said he or said they could get big retail rents. I think there was a lot of question if that would really happen or not, and it's mm. it's it's happened in a big way. Now, were you a part of the? Pally House, I think it's called, setting... We were not. No. no. But that, I believe the space already existed up top. It Old did. offices. It was offices. Yeah. On Swan. Look at that building. Now, I've always wondered, is that rusty metal, or what exactly is that there we're That's looking at? Core 10 steel, which is rusty metal. Interesting. I it's love made that look. To, uh, it's made to rust, and then it rusts to a certain extent, and it never... It doesn't rust past that, and so... It becomes a protective layer on the steel. Now, I would imagine when one of your customers comes to you and has an idea, hey, we want to put some sort of steel like that or something interesting on the facade, how do you curate these extremely specific 
contract subcontractors that would have either like the knowledge or the materials to provide something like that? I mean, it's a, we've done a lot of different things now. And I think we pride ourselves in making sure or, or not telling a customer, no, figuring out how to achieve that. Um, and so I think it's just, uh, if the, we can't find anybody locally that can take care of it, then we'll go out and figure out who the best is. And yeah. So and you guys we'll always say yes. We, we try to try to always say yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Tyler go scroll down. See if you can see that whole kind of <clears throat> all those facades there on Swan Avenue. It's really a beautiful look as you enter into the village. Yeah. That's perfect. 813 area.com on the left. Yeah. Look how significant that is. And, when I was growing up, I mean, what was it? Like Sharper Image was in there, kind of BS retail you'd find in almost a mall. But now it really feels like a boutique shopping experience. I'd imagine that that's what the owners were going for. They nailed yeah. it. Yeah, they nailed it. And more to come, too. I've seen some announcements of maybe even more high-end brands coming into the area. Yeah, yeah. There's there's rumors Hermes is coming to uh, Hyde Park and Gucci and others. I bet the line's going to be out the door. Cartier, I mean, a lot of those brands don't exist in Tampa. If they do, they might be at the International Mall. But Hyde Park Village is such a shopping, a city shopping destination that a, a large retailer like Hermes could come in and, and people, the, the customers are already there to yeah. take advantage of those products. Yeah, and I think I think that happening in Hyde Park is going to help downtown mm. because the retailers that are going to be displaced from here are going to go somewhere. And now the population centers that are going to service that retailer in downtown, the Heights and Water Street. So I think you'll see a retail growth happen or shift happen out of uh, Hyde Park and into the downtown areas. Yeah, that's a great thought because as those rents escalate and you do get those high-end brands, maybe not Lululemon, but a store like Lululemon is going to want a presence. And if downtown could provide more retail, that's probably where they're going to go. Yeah. So how did you guys, so we're still in kind of the um, construction phase of your business. You mentioned earlier in the show that the development part of your business really slowed dur during the recession. Now you've got some incredible developments coming up. How, did, how I believe two, correct. How did those first two come about? I guess we can start with Central and St. Pete. Yeah, so Central and St. Pete, um, we we were also on the development team for Hotel Haya in Ybor City. And uh, Central and St. Pete came about because we, uh, some friends of mine that were developing the Central and St. Pete, spent a lot of time at Hotel Haya. Hmm. So they came to us and said, would you be interested in being involved in a development in St. Pete? Uh, we said, absolutely. Um, and then it kind of grew into uh, a true development partnership where uh, we are now developing two and a half acres in downtown St. Petersburg. So it was a kind of, it started off, we were just going to do the hotel portion. And then we moved from the hotel portion to kind of reimagining the development. There was condos. We got rid of the condos. Uh, we're bullish on office as a as a sector in the market. I think if I was sitting in New York City, I might not say the same thing. Mm. But in Tampa, Florida, St. Pete, Florida, you know, I mean, St. Pete as a market has a sub ten percent vacancy. So, I mean, it is. It, if you look at it from a micro perspective, it's a very, very underserved market. So, mm. we we felt like St. Pete may have enough condos, not enough office, uh, and then parking, which is sorely needed in uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, that project was awarded to our partners from the city of St. Petersburg. It was the old police station site. Mm. So, the parking is a big deal, and that's. Uh, and then we're doing 42 affordable housing units as well. That's awesome. So if, if you look at from an impact from a city perspective to have the affordable housing to fill the parking issue void, and then also new office, which brings employees and people to the marketplace, it's a very, very good thing for the city of St. Petersburg as well. Absolutely. Yeah. If you said that on Fox Business, you think office is a is – a, 
the next big thing, people would go, what the hell are you talking about? But we really are in this insulated market here that's unlike anything else in the country. Just in terms of growth, in terms of defining projects that didn't exist 15 years ago. I mean, pre-Oxford, nobody thought any anything we've discussed was possible for Tampa. Agreed. Yeah, I also Tampa and or the Tampa Bay market, nobody built any significant urban office space here for years. Yeah. I, I mean, it, since the 80s. And so um, that in, in its own right tells you that the market needs to be served, right? I mean, you can't, mm-hmm. you need true class A amenitized office space in both markets, both urban markets, St. Pete and Tampa. Um, again, Water Street, we talked about right. $70 rents. Uh, and then and here in St. Petersburg, you know, we'll, the office building will be attached to a, a hotel. So, and then, um, so they'll have access to our uh, co-working space, which is a floor of conference rooms. They'll be able to, as a tenant, you'll be able to go on your phone, order, book a conference room, order lunch from the restaurant or whatever, or breakfast, have it catered, and go down and use the facility. We're doing a, we're partnering with a um, local fitness group that'll have a whole floor in the hotel. So as a wow. as a owner of, or as a uh, tenant in the office, you're you're going to have a membership to that fitness as well as we're going to open that up to memberships to the community. So again, driving people through the, to the hotel to use the fitness experience. Um, so again, another amenity for the office. So we're really, and then you've got 18,000 square feet of retail on the first floor of the office, which again will become amenities. So we believe a true class A office experience with those types of amenities are going to drive uh, uh, occupancy and rents in the marketplace. Yeah. And if you think about it, you don't have to have a big boardroom, right? We've got one for you. So you can also be more efficient with your office space. Now, how, like, I don't see anything like this in St. Pete at all. This is really the first of its kind in not only time, decades, but also in quality. Like, I don't see any other office like this in St. Pete existing at all. No, I mean, this is, we we aim to be the top of the market here for yeah. sure. Yeah. And we believe we're all about Great architecture, great design, great interiors. Again, like we talked about, our experience has taught us that the better it is, the better it's received, and it's going to uh, really perform well. Mm. Also, when we're developing, we're also building. And so I believe we can we have an advantage of being able to really understand the cost and trying to design a product to a cost instead of designing a product, figuring out it's too expensive and then doing a very hasty uh, value engineering process. So we kind of watch it as it grows, make sure that we can afford to do it under the pro forma. Do you believe that other large developers that are in New York that aren't going to play the office game will look at Tampa in the next few decades and go, all right, we, we need to get a project going down there? I do for sure. I mean, the the gas plant district that they're doing in St. Pete Hines is coming in as the partner there. Wow. I mean, they have a 1.2 million square feet of office planned uh, in that development. Damn. And by the way, they're, they're believers of highly, highly designed, highly amenitized office is lease as well. We actually toured some of their projects in Atlanta. Um, it was fascinating because you had, they had two brand new, highly amenitized office buildings that were 100% occupied, highest rents uh, in the in the market in Atlanta. Across the street was a beautiful office tower built in the early 2000s, completely empty, and hmm. yeah. begging people to move there. And so, you know, it's just people want to be in great spaces. I found on an absolutely much smaller scale in the little investments that I've made, whether it's flipping houses or owning a small portfolio of rental units or like this building we own, which we'll be making renovations to, quality actually mitigates risk. And so if you can build and design something that's beautiful, that people love, it actually takes a little bit of the speculative risk out of a development because more buyers and more tenants are attracted to it. 
hundred percent. Are you finding that in your, your builds and your products is people it's, it's so pretty and people look up and they're in awe. They've never seen anything like it that it actually makes the investment more juicy. Yeah. 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 And they know the investment will wear well. Right. So they know when they buy something of quality that when they go to sell it 20 years from now, that it's not going to cost them as much to maintain it over those 20 years. And it's going to still be relevant. Yeah. This is gorgeous. The architecture is unbelievable. So is this the final design we're looking at here? It is. Yes. Go to that picture on the left, Tyler. Are we good? I saw you moving around all set. Yeah. The picture all the way to the left of the courtyard, man, one more. Unbelievable. It looks like something in Manhattan. Um, like I said, this just doesn't exist in the area. So kind of what we're looking at right here in this photo, there's a courtyard space. I assume on the right is a sort of restaurant. Yeah. We call it the jewel, jewel box retail. It'll, I would think it'll probably be a restaurant. We Do haven't, we? we haven't programmed it yet. Okay. But. So working on a partner right yeah. now, trying to figure that out. And then you've got two towers. Correct. One office tower, one hotel. Yeah. 170 room hotel, which is a Marriott autograph uh, with a flagship restaurant that'll open up onto this courtyard across the first floor there. And then we've got event space above that. And then we've got the fitness concept we talked about, which is up in that kind mm. of s slot in the middle. And then where you see these big arches on the left, uh, we have a 120 person theater. Wow. So like an old cabaret style theater that you can use for uh, residents, shows and residents, or you could have a sales summit. It has LED walls. It's super tech enabled, but it looks like it's something from the, from the fifties uh, mm. when, um, and so again, highly amenitized. We're inviting the community in, in many different ways, right? The restaurant, theater, event space, a fitness uh, program. So our goal is the office users are using it, the community is using it, and the hotel guest is using it. Mm. So you create an energy that then makes it compelling to be there. Yeah, a, tr a destination yeah. rather than a one-use concept. Yeah. It's also, too, like I feel mixed use is what my generation wants. Like it's what we look for. You know, we want to be able to like go downstairs, grab coffee, grab groceries, work, come back upstairs. It seems like my generation's not so keen in general on the suburban lifestyle. Yeah. I, I, I think there's been a big shift. I don't think it's just your generation. I think it's, I think if you talked to water street, they would tell you, I mean, they had no idea they were going to get the response they did from the boomers who were sold their homes in Avala and sold their homes in West chase and moved to a small unit in water street is there empty nesters They've got disposable income, and there's great restaurants. And same thing that you want. They want to be able to go down yeah. and get a coffee. They don't want to drive to Publix that's 20 minutes away. A shift in the <clears throat> American mindset, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, in kind, a lot of of ways. A, it's kind of a return to yeah. kind of the way things were, right? we got a long way to go, that's for we sure. Do. Transportation's we do. an issue. Everything we kind of spoke yeah, yeah. about offline, but fantastic. Just super well done. Um, so this is already broken ground. It has, yes. The, the parking garage uh, broke ground. Uh, we did a groundbreaking and a presentation of our, we have a public art piece that'll be in the courtyard that Yala Ford is doing that uh, honors the Courageous 12. So we unveiled that art piece and uh, broke ground on the parking garage, I don't, probably 45 days ago. And you spoke about something interesting before we went live. There's a deficit in St. Pete of 3,500 parking spaces. This is providing 500 or so? 580 public Massive. parking spaces. Massive. And then Tampa, conversely, has too many parking spaces. T yes, downtown Tampa has too many parking spaces. Working in both markets, now that you're doing these large projects in both markets, what are you seeing in... Because there's, there's multiple things to talk about, right? There's like government, availability of permits, the relationship you have with, with the government, getting projects through, there's that. But there's also economics, 
what what's kind of some major differences you're seeing in these two markets that are connected by a bridge? They're so close, but so different. Uh, you know, I think um, St. Pete, you could argue from an urban market, is ahead of Tampa. Um, and I think that I've really thought a lot about that. And I think it's because Pinellas County only has one urban market, which mm. is downtown St. Pete. I mean, there is downtown Clearwater, but that has its own challenges because of uh, just kind of the comp- the composition of who's there. Um, but so you, I think when you really look at it, downtown St. Pete is really, I mean, they have one urban market for all of Pinellas County. So we think we're super bullish on downtown St. Pete. Also, they've engaged the water for right years, ever, yeah. forever, right? Uh, and what, you know, the Glazer family bought the Vinoy, and they're taking what was a sleepy kind of conference hotel and turning it into a, a first-class hospitality experience. Um, per capita, downtown St. Pete has more museums than any uh, uh, downtown in, in the country. Wow. Per capita, I think they're in the top 10 for billionaires, which I thought was fascinating. Like if you, you look at kind of the metrics for downtown St. Pete, it's, it's a pretty exciting market. Um, what it doesn't have that Tampa has is office space and corporate headquarters. And it's more, it doesn't have that and it never will. I don't know that it'll ever get to the same level of Tampa, but it has its own kind of drivers. And well, so, and, and also, too, does it need to because Tampa is so close by? You've got those 40-story office buildings a half hour away. Yeah, it's like Dallas and Fort Worth where uh, right. Fort Worth has a, a corporate culture but not even close to what Dallas does. And I think you'll see a similar kind of relationship happen here over time between Tampa and St. Petersburg. I think that's always been the vibe, too, where Tampa has had more of a metropolitan feel People in suits walking around, large, you know, a, a attorney, uh, uh, legal industry, bigger business, and then St. Pete has kind of had that artsy culture, retiree, and then it's expressed today too. Like, <clears throat> if you're in downtown St. Pete, there's just you know, like more coffee shops and people enjoying the outdoors i don't know it's almost like tampa's brooklyn in a sense if, if that that's kind of, a good yeah good description. If, if that makes sense which is really cool i think it's cool because both markets can exist in this very cohesive way and complement each other i don't think there's a whole lot of competition i i truly believe that they're just very different yeah i'm a by the way i push regionalism every chance i get with yeah. our local politicians because we're much more powerful as a regional force than we are as an individual force. And we're, like you said, we're complementary to each other. It's not a, it, it, we shouldn't really look at it as don't include those guys in this because they're competition. They're not that mm-hmm. we, we are much stronger as a region and Tampa will continue to be the employment center Tampa. And listen, Tampa's downtown is water streets, very vibrant. Mm-hmm. And I think as all the neighborhoods get connected in t- downtown, so the Heights connects to Ebor, Ebor connects to Channel Side, Channel Side connects, reconnects to the CBD, which they're doing now with all their realignment of all the streets. It becomes a really dynamic urban uh, environment. Yeah, pause right there, Tyler. I, I want to talk. I want to shift over to Tampa's urban core um, with, and maybe bring up the Studio HP photo too which is here on the wall Casey that's the one I think we were looking at that earlier but it it shows and that's an old photo by the way we'll pull it up here in a second but it shows a lot of the projects that have been proposed or plans in the last few years this was done May last year so almost a year old so it certainly doesn't include some of the projects that you've announced etc and it's also including some stuff that probably won't happen like the Port Tampa all of the those towers and i know they certainly have plans but anyway when go back to the map tyler the real map when i look at tampa's urban core and i think about all these blue buildings it makes me imagine like what are we really looking at in the next 30 years like throughout my career i'm 31 right like raising children doing business here in the city and watching it grow like what are we looking at 
at the end of my life. Like, holy shit, are we looking at a city the size of like Boston or something? I mean, it's it's kind of crazy how much development all in one place this is happening. Yeah, I mean, I think you're looking at, yes, you're looking at a city the size of Boston, maybe a little bigger. I mean, you're going to get a ton of density. It's happening now on the west bank of the river. The Heights is going to continue to densify. Ebor is going to fill in where it can. And then Gasworks is going to fill in a huge piece of huge. kind of that section. And then Water Street Phase 2 and Phase 3. And then eventually that north side of downtown where all the parking lots are will start to start to change as well, which then really kind of completes the – kind of completes it all. And then, you know, there's big drivers coming like Brightline – uh, we'll have a stop in Ybor City. It'll have a stop in West Shore. I mean, that that's going to continue to push uh, density and, and demand to the marketplace. I had on SPP's Dave Bavert. Uh, yeah. He's the uh, senior, the vice president of leasing and corporate strategy. And we were talking about the Riverwalk expansion on the east side, Ybor Harbor with Daryl Shaw, and then Gasworks as well. All those, I believe, 70, 80 acres up there. You know, plus Ebor, plus, 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 right? And he was saying this horseshoe effect, you know, he described it as a horseshoe. I thought that was perfect. You really do have this horseshoe of transportation in terms of a river walk, potentially a trolley line. And then in the middle of all that, you've got this really massive, dense urban core from, I guess it would be Palm Avenue yep. all the way south to the water. I mean, this is a huge area we're looking at. If you could walk from, let's say, the Columbia Restaurant in East Ybor City over to Armature Works, down to the convention center, and the entire way was shops and restaurants and residential, we're talking about a very large city here. Yeah. Yeah, and we're, I mean, we're well along our way. We certainly are. And a lot of the projects in that Studio HB, those are a lot of those are approved. The money's there. The real estate ownership is there. I mean, these aren't some far-fetched ideas. Like, no, these are projects that are going to happen. I try to tell people that on the show, like, you know, if you're not in favor, per se, of the growth or the change, unless you want to pull up, put up a wall around Tampa, like, this is happening. People are going to want to move to this incredibly beautiful place. And if we don't produce supply, we're going to be in even more trouble than we are. We and, are. And I yeah. get it. I grew up here and I'm trying to buy a house right now. It's tough. It's very expensive. I'm renting. It sucks. <laughs> but um, it is what it is. And we're lucky to live in a place where people are coming versus, I don't know, a lot of other markets around the country where people are leaving. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, and, and affordable housing is one of those key issues that a lot of people talk about. And and as density comes and as all of those product types come, whether it be high end middle range, and then the low end, you're going to see the uh, relief for affordable housing in that as well because the flight, you know, because the market, if there's enough supply in the high-end market, they won't put pressure on markets downstream. Same thing with the second home buyer, the middle market, same thing with then It frees up inventory, frees up dirt for that entry-level, re, uh, that entry-level kind of residential. And so, it's a positive. It's not a negative. I mean, a, a condo tower, uh, you know, in downtown Tampa that's selling at $1,200 a foot is a positive. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will free up, it's going to free up density somewhere else for affordable housing then to happen. So I, I, I do believe the responsible density in our downtown core only makes us a healthier market long term. And really, too, back to the inception of Tampa, Tampa was, like many American cities, a very dense urban core. We we joke about it all the time on the podcast. We talk about the old trolley line. People get mad because I bring it up like every episode. But if you look at that old trolley line map, we were this was a serious transportation system. I mean, we had trolley lines that went everywhere. They were everywhere. Now we don't have, what do we have? One from Ebor down to the convention center, basically. They need to extend that thing, man. The question is funding, right? Is it too early? You know, I think it's inevitable though. We're, we're going to need that at a certain point. Yeah, they're working on it. They'll get it done. We're, in our Heights project, we are, we dedicated right away so that the trolley could come down Palm. Let's uh, dig into that. Project. 
let's dig into that Heights project. Tyler, could you pull up those renderings? I've emailed you. You should have everything. Um, I wanted to ask you that specifically. I know the trolley has a sort of grant. I'm not exactly sure what the holdup is. It might have been all for transportation. It something is. Like it's held that. up in the all for transportation. Yeah, that that's a frustrating issue. Basically was held up. I mean, semantics, really. Yeah. Legal jargon. Yep. Um, but I wanted to ask, have you planned and are you thinking about future transportation? Because this is a project that, again, is a destination. People are going to want to come and enjoy it and, and go to and from. Is there a, a position you're looking at? Like, hey, here's probably where the trolley's going to go. Let's focus the development to be positioned in a way that captures, I guess that's Florida Avenue right there on the east side. Yeah, so the plan is the trolley would come up Florida and then turn left on the Palm. And so uh, FDOT has right away on the east side of Florida for set aside for the trolley. Uh, and, and in the meantime, when they do their improvements, until that's a trolley, it'll be a pedestrian uh, walkway. And then it's supposed to come down Palm, take a left, and then head into the Armature Works project. And so, you know, but we, um, we really focused on – making sure this site was as flexible as possible for future uh, transportation needs. So wide sidewalks on both Florida and Ashley or Tampa. We, we have no loading docks on Florida or Tampa. We did a, because of the elevation here, we actually did a tunnel underneath the hotel and the office so that we, all of our loading, all of our trash, everything is, is uh, cut and is in a cut and fill tunnel underneath those uh, because we didn't know, we didn't want, uh, to impede any future transit. So if there's transit stops on that need to be added on Tampa or Florida, we can accommodate it. We've got the space. We've got the, we don't have, we're not going to have to impede on a loading dock or, uh, eat ingress, egress kind of an issue. So we were very, very cognizant of trying to make sure we're as flexible as possible, whatever that mass transit looks like yeah that we could be we could be friendly to it is that the city is it a city requirement or is that something ellison has made sure that they're planning for we're it's something that we've made sure we're planning for so you didn't have to do it that way we did not have to do it that way mm, that's frustrating because because part of me says why wouldn't the local government make sure especially on a large-scale mixed-use development that whoever's doing the project would plan for something like that. That's strange to me that the city wouldn't require it. Require it. Thank you, sir, for for making sure you did that. But at the same time, the government should make sure that that those things are accounted for. I mean, they definitely pushed for the trolley line. We that was a very early conversation. So, yeah. So they're they're very attuned to that. You know, it's you're dealing with the FDOT. I mean, it's a complicated. Uh, right. That's true. A, that's a different show for a different day. There's a lot of agencies yeah, with yeah. roads around this, this A lot area. of interests and a lot of varying opinions. Yeah. So so in this picture here, is this Palm and Avenue up front? No, this is Oak across the bottom. Okay. This is uh, Franklin that comes up through the middle. So Franklin extends from the south to the north. This is the old Standard Oil building is on the right. So that'll become the new, uh, that'll be F&B and B and kind of uh, public spaces for the hotel that attaches to the back. Mm. Uh, and then we're doing a 180-room hotel with 40 condos uh, attached to that. We're doing a – there's a glass gallery that connects the back of the Standard Oil building to the hotel, mm. and that's going to be dedicated um, gallery space for local artists. Oh, cool. So it'll be a constant rotating uh, art exhibition in that space. And it's a great way to kind of transfer a modern structure into a modern structure on connected to something as historic as the Standard Oil Building. Across the street is uh, office, 160,000 uh, square feet of office. There's a great view right there. So kind of a top down. Yeah. So this is kind of kind of north would be on the top right side, right? So yes. Franklin. And then where are where's the current YMCA would be on that Palm Avenue block, correct? It would. Just so I can understand exactly yeah. where we are here. 
And then that's kind of sprouts right on the left. Where that is. Wow. So a true puzzle piece for Tampa Heights, like a very strategic, great location yeah. that'll fit right in with a lot of that other development. Yeah. I mean, this really completes the link uh, between Ybor City and, and the Heights. Um, and takes an area now that, you know, in an urban environment shouldn't be the way it is. It's a bunch of parking lots and yeah. kind of derelict structures. It's not a very attractive place. So, um, and at the end of the day, you're going to get a world-class YMCA out of it, which will serve the community, the Heights community, as well as surrounding communities. It'll create, this is a, the majority of this project is a long-term land lease with the YMCA. Mm. So it creates uh, long-term revenue streams for the YMCA that then they can use to go out and serve other communities. So we're excited about it. We think it's a very, very compelling model for nonprofits in urban markets that have excess land. So they're essentially partnering up with you in that way. They are. And yeah. it, it ensures some good finances for them, and then they can focus on whatever they want to focus on. Correct. So were they very excited to have you as a partner and – they were do this yeah. project, yeah, yeah. Derelict structures, and that's like, guess what neighborhood I'm talking about in Tampa? You know, yeah. it was once derelict structures. It's just, <laughs> it's it's and parking lots, right? And parking lots too. Wow. So look at the why, man. That's phenomenal. I might get a membership. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's first. It's going to be the, the best why in the southeastern United States for sure. So let's talk about that tunnel. That's interesting. So because of the elevation and the heights, you were able to do a tunnel. Yep. And that would save basically what? An ugly, ugly concrete wall on the Florida Avenue side. So explain. Exactly. And, bur and, and loading docks, right? Right. Coming off of those major thoroughfares with dumpsters and all the. Serve the hotel, all that. Yeah. yeah. And, and banquets, everything. Like you're, you're taking that kind of unattractive, uh, Act, you know, the big truck sitting in front of the hotel unloading all the event stuff, we're putting that underground so mm. you don't see it as a, you'll never experience that as a customer of the hotel to understand that that's even going on. And, and and the community too, the community doesn't have to deal with, you know, the truck block in the street, you can't get by, all those kind of things that happen when you don't have the ability to go subterranean. It's fantastic. And where exactly would, oh, this is great, top down view. So where would this tunnel be? You can see it kind of through the see the arrow on the left. Ah, and it's yep, where the so, roundabout is, right in the yep. middle. So you come in, you turn around down there, and you come back out onto Tampa. Amazing. Yeah, I've always wondered in Tampa Heights, like, you know, can we do underground parking? Subway sounds insane, but I don't know why not. With enough funding, anything's possible. With enough, any, anything's possible. Supplying enough money, and you can make it happen. Well, it's probably hard for you to pick which project you're most excited for because all of these are so dynamic. Nothing from what I've seen you guys are doing is standard. It's always high quality, high design. I mean, the tunnel is genius, really. Is, is again, like all of your projects have those qualities. It must You must have a long-term vision. You must not want to move on to a different market like it sounds like you guys are here to stay for a long long time yeah we're here to stay for a long, yeah. long time we you know if you can do something to make the community you live in better why i mean right why not right right so and we are believers in in always pushing the bar from a design and quality standpoint it's phenomenal i don't think we missed anything how long we've been going tyler i saw you scrambling Beautiful. Well, that's perfect. We'll have to have you back on for a follow-up episode. This yeah. was really awesome. Super nice to meet you. Um, Ellison Development, everyone, follow them. I believe they're on, what, Instagram? How can people follow along? Yeah, yeah, we're on Instagram and obviously on the on the web as well. EllisonDevelopment.com. Phenomenal. Thank you for this quality approach. I appreciate it. Did we miss anything? I don't think so. We covered it all. As much as we could. Beautiful. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank you guys for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like it. Check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Give us a comment. Give us some feedback. We want to know how we're doing. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.